This is a University of Otago podcast. Is there something about this side of the room that you don't like that side of the room? (laughs) Okay, good. Um, Well, I would like to be the first person to welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture. Um, As you know, achieving the rank of professor at the University of Otago um, is an amazing achievement. Um, We have incredibly strict standards um, for our academic staff and we apply them um, rigorously. So to be promoted from within is no small feat. Um, And so I think it's such a great opportunity for us during these uh, inaugural professorial lectures to come together as a university community and to celebrate the success of one of our own and at the same time actually learning something about uh, the incredible scholars that are within our midst. I would like to introduce uh, the Dean of the Business School and the Pro Vice Chancellor of Commerce, Professor George Benwell, um, who will provide introductory remarks of our inaugural professor. Good evening and welcome, Vice-Chancellor, Professor Nyoth, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, a very warm welcome to Jürgen's wife, Kate, and family. Please feel at home. Professor Jürgen Noth was educated as a grammar school teacher in Germany, teaching English literature and drama. Since he began his academic career at Otago, Um, And in the Otago Business School 18 years ago, Professor Noth has studied consumer behaviour and networking amongst businesses. His collaborative research has resulted in some 80 refereed publications, 15 book chapters and three edited books. He has supervised 14 PhD students and 26 further postgraduate students both at Otago and at other international overseas uh, university. He's had a number of prestigious speaking engagements, both here in New Zealand and overseas, at academic as well as professional gatherings. His research focus is on cross-cultural consumer behaviour, particularly in tourism, and on the sustainable resource management of tourist destinations. He has developed research programs that involve the phenomenology of experiences, the underpinnings of these experiences, and the impacts of, and the interactions with, commer- uh, sorry, and interactions with commercial realities in the co-creation of place and destination brands. There will be a test on that sentence later. The basis of his research approach is humanism, complexity, and social systems theory. His focus is on cross-cultural tourism or tourist behaviour extends even further to general consumers and into SMEs and entrepreneurship, destination management and branding. His international collaboration, sorry, his internationally collaborated research reflects his integration of consumption behaviour and the consumer culture theory on the one hand and critical service theory on the other. But most importantly, the model he reveals today seeks to help create sustainable tourism products. He believes that such products can only be grounded in a destination sense of place and uniqueness and is not its ability to afford the largest theme parks, five-star hotels, convention centres and stadium. Full stop. Furthermore, Jürgen will discuss his latest research into what constitutes the tourism experience and how destinations can make use of this understanding to create more competitive tourism services. 
He is currently Associate Dean Academic in the Otago Business School, and more notably, and no doubt to him more rewardingly, he has been recently promoted to Professor in the Department of Marketing. Ladies and gentlemen, and Kate and family, Professor Jürgen Noth will give his presentation Strategic Destination Management, a Tourism Experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Noth. Sorry to give you such a mouthful. <laughs> ah, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Good evening, welcome, haere mai. Thank you very much for coming. This is a great honor for me to see uh, so many familiar faces all coming and spending the evening here. Uh, well, I would like to uh, begin my talk on strategic destination marketing and uh, the tourism experience model uh, by weaving some context around this topic. Currently, New Zealand is actively developing the Chinese market. After tourism numbers from traditional markets such as Japan, the US, Britain, seem to have peaked for the moment, the favored country status of New Zealand makes it easy for Chinese nationals to obtain New Zealand visa. The gates are open and, New uh, and Tourism New Zealand is advertising heavily, targeting this market. Nevertheless, there are still critical voices asking, hmm, what do we really know about the Chinese market and any other recently new market for that matter? What do we need to do to increase value for both the tourists and ourselves? The New Zealand Herald reports on the 18th of July, Air New Zealand's departing chief executive Rob Fife and his outspoken chairman John Palmer have rung alarm bells about the country's diminishing appeal as a destination for long-haul tourists. Appearing before MPs at Parliament, the pair called for urgent action by government and the industry to promote New Zealand as an attractive destination. But uh, Prime Minister John Key, who is also a tourism minister, says, the situation is not too bad, and has faith that uh, new infrastructure, including casinos, operators, Sky Cities, proposed National Convention Center, will help the industry along. And indeed, we all have heard that the Chinese market is keen on gambling as well as on shopping. But are these our core strengths? Is not Macau or Las Vegas far more attractive for gamblers? Should we compete with these destinations with Me Too products? Are casinos and convention centers all part of the 100% strategy? Is that what New Zealand is really about? No doubt the Minister in Tourism of Tourism takes heart from further industry responses to invest in infrastructure. As recent as the 9th of August in the New Zealand Herald and the ODT from 2 July, the CEO of New Zealand Holiday Camp Association announced that they are to invest in rice cookers. <laughs> because the new Chinese self-drive market that we expect to arrive soon would find them very handy. And because Chinese no, do actually no longer know how to cook rice in a pot as uh, Fergus Brown, CEO, has been cited. Apart from pots and pans, casinos and convention centers, serious thinking has been going on, no doubt. In a January 2011 brief to the incoming Minister of Tourism, the Ministry of Economic Development urges that we need to know more about our markets, that we need to, to better understand what drives tourists so that we may come up with better ideas of how we can increase arrivals and yield. On 12 August 2012, the New Zealand Herald reported, Tourism New Zealand, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, and Education New Zealand will lead a new development, engaging with 40 to 50 senior leaders across the private and public sectors who have experience in international markets. A New Zealand-based agency with a focus on brand strategy will then be developing to sell the New Zealand story. A toolkit will be developed for Kiwi business and uh, the public sector to draw on, on to help 
uh, tell the New Zealand story, including consistent branding, narrative and photos, economist, uh, economic development minister Stephen Joyce said. Maybe some storytelling, advertising and investing in pots and pans in key markets will help increase tourist numbers. But how will that increase yield in this notoriously low yield industry? What do we need to know and do on the ground to increase value? Government's ministries have been set high goals indeed. But Rick Bowen's New Zealand's Institute is questioning whether goals are actually strategies. The Institute reports on New Zealand's low achievement in productivity as compared to Australia and truly brings home the message that our return on investment, especially in tourism, could be far better. In Bowen's analysis and elsewhere, we learn that innovation and investment in skills and talent are most important. But what are the skills you need to develop and according to what strategy? Recently, the, new, uh, the Queenstown experience has been distinctly Brazilian. In many shops, bars, and other lower-level service encounters, New Zealand hospitality was performed by Brazilian helping out. Sorry, Francisco. Some 10 years ago, the experience in Queenstown had been distinctly Japanese when that market was up, as plenty of Japanese nationals were delivering what should have been the New Zealand experience. Was that part of infrastructure investment or of building competitive advantage to improve tourists' experiences? This presentation today wants to make a contribution by looking at the core of the tourism product, experiences. By analyzing their characteristics, it wishes to develop the foundation for a strategy which seeks to link this country its people, cultures, its social, natural, and economic resources tightly to the experience. The idea is that the episodic memories that result in good tourism experiences will create goodwill and increases in export. As I have been developing in previous models. What are the relevant points that lead us to analyze experiences as the key industry or the key issue for sustainable strategic development. A strategy has not just a goal, but a structure, and a structured set of steps to achieve that goal. Secondly, I think that a tourism destination holds a set of promises uh, that can be captured and administered by a destination brand. And a brand has a functional, experiential, and symbolic level and you need to combine these, interpret these, and combine these in order to create a unique brand. The product of a destination, thirdly, uh, is its experience. Its value is determined by its attractiveness to inspire and the memories it creates. And how much tourists are prepared to pay for it, of course. The experience must be inextricably linked to the destination, so it must be unique. These are basically the points of, um, that I'm trying to make um, and develop with the following ideas of the tourism model, underlying the tourism model. Why do people travel? The simplest answer is that tourists do what all organisms do. <coughs> They either try to get away from what harms them or they move towards something that attracts them. In marketing, we often refer to these as the push and pull forces of motivation, which are influenced by the situations we find ourselves in and the preferences we have or can afford. Holidays as escape are usually portrayed as traveling because of reasons, while the research for new horizons, uh, while the search for new horizons, self-fulfillment, and self-extension are reasons that describe travel in order to achieve something. Although these general categories are correct, life is often more complicated, and for those who can afford holidays, we find ourselves fulfilling far more complex scenarios, like creating our identity, fixing our relationships, getting back closer to our children again, or getting over the loss of a loved one. In these cases, destinations become the backdrop of some personal drama or the stage for some self-directed search for satisfaction. 
In these cases, two destinations are in danger of being merely the means to an end, over which the destination has neither control nor agency. While tourism here may create some benefit as the tourist is paying his or her way, there is no long-term relationship, no appreciation of the destination's uniqueness unless we make the solution of their problems part of our strategy. We cannot always condone tourists' behavior nor interfere, but we can understand that people need opportunities for recreation and to solve their problems. Recreation occurs especially when people's self has been damaged, when their identity has suffered. That can occur when stress at home or at work becomes intolerable, when the tourist simply starts to doubt him or herself, when his or her existential being begins to suffer. Tourists whose self needs reconstructing usually seek safe experiences, ones where they are not challenged and where they can increase their self-worth, where they can rebuild their self-confidence. That usually means they do not seek new learning, but self-assurance, not reminders of the immediate past, but entertainment and distraction, not unpredictable or uncontrollable situations, but ones where they can easily retreat into familiar circumstances and a feeling of total control. Conversely, tourists who are in balance or who are self-confident and maybe in need of a break to recharge batteries or who are seeking to extend themselves often like to test themselves in areas they feel they neglected and get into new situations where they can explore and learn. Gibson and Yanakis uh, in 92 have produced a list of 15 roles that tourists like to play, I show only seven here. These sociologically conceived roles usually follow stereotypical scripts and schema of behavior. The roles are based on motivational holiday and preferred activity profiles constructed from survey data. Similarly, uh, such uh, researchers such as Plog and Butler have produced models by which destinations can be classified according to the types of tourists they attract. Other researchers have classified tourists in terms of the involvement they seek with the destination or whether they seek authentic uh, experiences or not. There is as yet, however, no overarching theory that manages to integrate all of these approaches coherently. In addition, previous theories give destination marketers little to go by in terms of creating sustainable competitive advantage other than suggesting to satisfy customers' needs. That is too easily interpreted as supplying necessary infrastructure, pots and pans. Here I'd like to suggest a solution by approaching these issues by answering how do tourists become aware of a destination? And how can we link the solution of tourists' aspirations to a sustainable advantage for the destination and without merely providing a me-too solution? Experiences come to us via our senses. We are aware of sensations and feelings we acquire and to which we learn to react. We also have experiences of thoughts and concepts telling us that we know that we are experiencing something. We then use concepts to pin down what we are experiencing in learned experiences. And here it is, of course, that the English language has just a simple word, experience, which is a verb and a noun. Other languages have two of those, and you will unfortunately hear this word too often, but uh, I can't avoid it. Yet there is a difference between experiencing and experience. Experiencing is our fundamental mechanism by which we learn. We require this mechanism so that we can adopt, uh, so that we can adapt to our ever-changing environments. Indeed, we are even compensated for wanting to learn through our own internal mechanisms, holding an interest, anticipating, but also remembering particularly pleasant moments is related to feeling pleasure. Neuropsychology has found, for example, that having pleasant memories or looking forward to experiencing things correlate with the sec secretion of dopamine in the brain, giving us feeling of pleasure. 
So when people go on holidays, their holiday experience has already started long before they are actually leaving for their destination, during the time of choosing, planning, and anticipating. Because tourism services are intangible, we cannot test them before purchase. Modern technology now allows tourists to find out much more of the experiences that they might be having. By going on to the internet, checking out the facilities of the hotels or transport opportunities they might be using. We can thereby often get a good idea of what the attraction that drives us to a destination could be like, as we can see video clips and read or even hear endorsements from previous travelers. Modern marketing is exploiting the opportunities of the relevant technology as well. But these virtual pre-visits also bear in them a danger. A danger excuse me. Pre-trip visualizations made in the comfort of one's home can cause the actual physical experience to lose appeal as it is assimilated or processed stereotypically. So that little of the uniqueness of the experience is processed or appreciated. But was the experience merely a confirmation of what the tourist already knew? Are virtual experiences really as powerful as physical experiences at the destination? What has been lost or what does this, tu what does this tourist at the destination not get in his experiences? How does it happen that tourists tick off places like shopping items without experiencing their true uniqueness? It all has to do with how we learn to experience, or more precisely, how we experience our lived experience, or being in the world, as Heidegger calls it. We all come into this world as human beings. All that separates us is physical space and the time at which we are, we are born. On average, we come into this world with our sensory capacities and to develop our physical and mental skills. While we certainly appear to have individual characteristics and idiosyncrasies when growing up, personality and particularly identity and constructs of the self only truly develop with puberty, get into full swing during adolescence and in some societies generate elaborate efforts and behavioral scripts that may be called Project I, or Projects of Self-Discovery. In New Zealand, we welcome many of those young people on trips of self-discovery as backpackers, who in their late teens and early twins are full of this sense of self-focused energy. They test this energy in themselves, they apply it, and observe their reactions introspectively and by constantly reflecting on how their parents or their peers back home may react to their experiences in inner dialogues. Nevertheless, besides these individualistic patterns of behavior in this particular market, there are other themes and schemas of experiencing in other age cohorts and according to life stages. Young families, while dealing with the chaos of keeping kids safe, clean and fed while traveling, also seek to share the children's amazement at the destination's wonders, as much as they themselves seek to make the children learn to appreciate the simplicity of washing in a creek, for example. Experiencing here is described in terms of human development, where the life stage helps describe how consciousness receives the destination. Essentially, when relating to the human being, our consciousness strives for, struggles with, and seeks to be existentially authentic. For that helps us to consistently muster the energy to survive. Like in these tourism examples, we can recognize that people see convergence in their being as they do elsewhere. They reflect on continuously merging their individual capabilities with their social opportunities. When we talk about work-life balance, we actually admit 
that there can be a disruption between us as a human being and us as a person with social obligations. Please hold the following thought. I maintain here that fundamentally the differences between how a tourist's consciousness becomes aware of a destination as a human being as opposed to becoming aware of it as a person helps model how the tourist links up with, learns about, and appreciates a destination. So while we are all coming into this world as human beings, we then grow into persons. We grow up into a society and learn all about its expectations and values, its standards and norms. We also learn to observe ourselves as we can become aware of our awareness and whether we converge with societal expectations in our behavior. The practice of rules, the repetition of behavior or of, uh, of our rites and rituals help us build and constantly recreate, recreate? recreate our uh, community. The practice of such repetition <laughs> builds observable <laughs> outcomes of security, trust, hierarchy, distribution of goods and services, mechanisms of transferring knowledge, social differences between members, and markers of social and cultural identity. Through habitus, we create social capital, but also schema and scripts by which we approach new experiences as we progress in life. In fact, at times, sociocultural indoctrination can take on such strength that some of those persons it creates totally forget about the, their own humanity. If you look at the bloody-mindedness of religious zealots or the bigotry of political fanatics, you get a sense of the strength that processes of inculturation and socialization can achieve. Nevertheless, we need culture and society to develop ourselves as human beings. There is thus a symbiotic relationship between individual and society which exists in the links between the complex structures of each society's habitus and human existential authenticity. At a weaker level, at a less dehumanizing level, socialization nevertheless also creates what Heidegger calls everydayness. It is what we can metaphorically fall into as one can find comfort in anonymity by simply copying what everybody else does. Indeed, each society considers conformity a virtue in one way or another. It finds different expression and intensity as each cultural system is different. But it generally seems to promote habitual learning. Habitual learning is a forceful way of creating deep-seated affective response behavior that can easily prevent destinations from making a strong claim in a tourist's experience for their stereotype. To understand this a little more, we look at what Husserl has um, called tourists' lived experience and what Heidegger calls one's Dasein or being. My lived experience is the particular way I see and feel the world around me. Nobody else can experience the world the way I do. Just consider how we see the reality of this lecture theater. While we may all agree that we are in a lecture theater, for some it is a place of a celebration, like for me, although I'm shaking like a leaf. While for others it may be the equivalent of the house of pain, and for others, yet another boring evening in the line of duty. But hark, <laughs> but hark, there shall be a soothing drop at the end of this uh, in the staff club, I understand. As Husserl pointed out to us, the lived experience is far more than what others can observe. Martin Heidegger, who at one stage was Husserl's senior assistant, calls this lived experience our Dasein, or our being, while being in the world. We may believe that being or sensing our Dasein in this world is precisely what tourists wish to do when they go traveling, even if they are just gazing or escaping their workaday world. In his analysis of Dasein, Heidegger makes some very interesting observations which run alongside some insights that Wittgenstein 
gave us when he looked at our use of language by which we often grasp the experience of our being. Heidegger observed that as we grow up, we keep bumping into things which, upon reflection on their existence, make us expect certain qualities of these things, like mom and dad coming to your bedside, giving you cuddles and food. Even if we make less uh, fortunate experiences, whenever we then meet new things, we inadvertently compare what we previously experienced with the new. So that in reality, when looking at the new, we really keep looking backwards at what we already know to figure out the new. We thereby often prevent ourselves from realizing what is new. In fact, we often prevent ourselves from realizing the potential of our Dasein, our being. Wittgenstein makes a similar observation in that when we think, the concepts we use rely on what we learned in the past. They are like icebergs. And what we often do not realize is that what is underneath the waterline is all the emotional and contextual baggage that we carry with us and which now impinges on our experience as we are becoming aware of the destination. Again, instead of looking outward toward the new experience of the destination, we look backwards and hence prevent the full potential experience at the destination. In other words, by carrying our past with us, into the new situation of the destination. We prevent ourselves from experiencing our existential authenticity, our human beingness. And I can't help it but to bring this point home. My being and being in the world is often different from my lived experience. While I experience the world, I perceive far less of what is really in front of me. Because in experiencing, I look backwards at my experience to understand what is in front of me, unless I probe and analyze it. That was a big sentence, wasn't it? I should have cut it down. This subjectivity not only includes tourists' prior knowledge to experiencing the destination, but their perception is also guided by their feelings and physiological conditions and their cognitive abilities to process any information. Even more poignantly, Alva Noor from Berkeley says, how the experience presents things as being is the intentional content of our experience. The influence of the tourist's being reigns strongly over what the tourist actually experiences. It means that what we seek to focus on or what we seek to perceive is what we pay attention to. The other things we stereotype. For example, when seeing the Dunedin railway station from the town belt, we may see the Pacific Ocean in the background, but we may be stereotyping it down to just the concept of ocean or even just water. What happens at that moment is that we lose a massive chunk of information which could strongly influence our appreciation of this architectural piece of art built in the wilderness of the Southern Pacific Ocean as it is surrounded by immense natural riches but also the humble beginnings of a staunch bicultural nation where two civilizations are beginning to merge. Its tower stands out as a pillar on reclaimed land that symbolizes the addition and expansion to Naitahu's world and their Turangawaiwai. Stereotyping the ocean, as tourists might do, like in this example, is a way of perceptual coping. We often need to stereotype in order to manage information overflow. For tourism destinations, however, stereotyping is a stumbling block to building competitive advantage. This phenomenon that tourists ignore differences of failing to finding access to the uniqueness of how all the destination characteristics come together in a new experiences, in a new experience, appears to happen more and more. As travelers become more experienced, they, are beca they may become more discerning. At the same time, however, they may also stereotype more what should have been discerned as the key strategic difference. 
Marketers' focus on internal, company-specific service quality has created a painfully inward-looking marketing culture. This has created an excessive concern for infrastructure, so that more and more tourist destinations are becoming exchangeable by offering similar services and Me Too attractions. In a representation of the tourism experience model, we can turn, discern four basic Exper experiential groups. The model has two axes. They represent the tourist's mode of consciousness by which they become aware of and engage in their activity at the destination. <coughs> you can also see four segments. The sizes of the bubbles do not indicate the size of these markets. Each destination will have different distributions by which they may decide where to put their efforts, invest in skills and innovation, etc. I will now briefly describe the meaning of the quadrants and then give examples of how we may conceive of the types of tourists there are, with an example of their experiencing the destination and what could be done to further tie the destination into their episodic <coughs> memory. Now, I would have liked to present you here with um, research that I have done in these areas. Um, but I found that I might better end up uh, paraphrasing this so that we can all go to the pub. <laughs> As time is pressing, and I can see some thirsty faces, I will also try to weave in an example or two of how episodic memory can be created. Episodic memory brings together time, place, and events. There's a very important uh, tool that marketers could uh, make conscious use of. While spontaneous, the examples are trying to show how memory can be irretrievably tied to the destination by letting tourists have existentially authentic experiences. In their activities, the authenticality existential human beings seek to clear themselves of their social cultural baggage, focus on the inner being, and what may prevent them from appreciating their surroundings, nature, and other fellow human beings. I'm now talking about the top of that um, mode of consciousness. Being existentially authentic means being open to all new experiencing at the destination. However, if in a recreational mode, which is the uh, familiar repetitive self-directed side, which through repetition creates things like habitus in a society, uh, identity uh, in, in persons, um, so as to achieve recovery, well, let me read that again. However, if, a, if in a recreational mode, the tourist will engage in known activities so as to achieve recovery more quickly. Although they may have been at the destination before, they will appreciate it as if new, while they rediscover themselves in their chosen, controlled environment. If the destination is indeed new, the recreation-seeking tourists reduces the complexity of the newness to a controlled level by applying stereotypical knowledge and skills to manage the activity. For example, their spontaneity is bounded by the knowledge of safety that the activity they engage in affords. Using a bungee jump to show yourself that you can still do it is recreational as the tourist has done it or something like it before, and knows that A.J. Hackett has a good reputation. So he's not afraid of dying, just of jumping. Secondly, if we go um, conversely, the extreme exploring tourist is not afraid of getting totally out of his or her depth and doing things they have never done before, say, shaking up with a rough-looking kiwi in the bush on the west coast, on a whim, just because the chap has been going on about something called white bait, <coughs> abundance of venison, and a herb called puha that apparently makes every dish divine. Third, 
when the authenticality existential human being, uh, sorry, while the authentic existential human being is spontaneous, convergent, contemplative, dynamic, and teleological, as the literature summarizes uh, Heidegger's analysis, my corresponding view of the role authentic consciousness is that it views any activity as comparative, planned, or prescribed, divergent between standards and norms and accompanying emotions, structured and deterministic. For example, take your average Chinese group tourist staying on George Street in a hotel up the road, now at 6 p.m., wandering past shops and windows, ambling in and out of shops, looking at this, checking prices on that item, and even trying some new food, which sends shudders of excitement down the spine. Such behavior is, of course, stereotypical shopping behavior, yet still in a safe mode, as the tourist merely peeks into Dunedin's world, as it were. This changes drastically, however, as this group of merry Otago students, clad in togas, appear on the sidewalk. The tourist is baffled and knows not where to turn when he sees a kin ethnic face amongst the group and cannot help but stare. In turn, the student picks out that this looks like your stereotypical tourist, but strangely creates, creates a twang in the Kiwi-born ethnic student. He approaches the tourists, they establish who they are, where they are from, and as the student realizes that his group is moving on, he convinces the tourists to come with them. He never looks back, I bet, and might have difficulties finding his home tonight. While I make this up, of course, you can see what I mean by how the various tourists, all in their particular ways of experiencing the destination, can actually be allowed to become aware of authentic experiences within their own chosen, even controlled environments, where exploration is framed strictly by socially designed behavior. We can look at the model also from the point of view of the destination or any attraction. For example, take the nature tourist, knowledge seeker, who strikes up a pleasant conversation with a young zoologist student working at, as a guide at the Albatross colony. Lastly, the egoistic pleasure seeker. Nice story too, I thought. Uh, just in from Queenstown on a four-wheel drive to a, through the wild asphalt desert of the pig route. He didn't get his SUV quite dirty enough, so, uh, but still cruises down George Street and stops at the Albert Arms for a drink. Skiting as one does, the barman tells him about the safe but really awesome Dunstan Trail. After arriving back in Queenstown two days later, handing back the SUV and paying the fine, the chap leaves the resort in another rental car as he has heard of the Tiki Trail through Southland where all the wild Maori stories from the past came from that he downloaded on his iPhone app. This chap from Sydney, Darling Harbour, say, barely scratches the exploratory side of the activity axis, but has moved by leaps and bounds from the outer reaches of the pleasure-seeking quadrant up north to become more authentic and less cocooned in the safety of Queen's Tinseltown. The brief interpretation of the tourism experience model has hopefully shown the advantages of researching the ways and shapes consciousness takes hold of experiences. The model integrates most known tourism motivation and destination models into one cohesive theory, by which markets can be segmented along standard dimensions. In addition, because it includes or covers all potential sub-segments, it becomes far more transparent to establish market positions of destinations and plan for investment and innovation. It permits an integrated approach to comprehensive branding and market segmentation. This model now also permits a systematic development of an integrated branding strategy for different experiential market segments and shows up many tourism marketing measurement tools as severely flawed. Satisfaction or quality of service approaches, as we uh, know them, um, 
would differ significantly in their effectiveness of measuring the experience of the tourist, depending on where they are in these quadrants. Indicative research on random data sets has already shown that many of our marketing measurement tools are severely flawed in light of the fundamentals of this model, which I'm publishing, hopefully, um, still this year in tourism analysis. I also hope that it has brought home the need why tourism operators need to collaborate and network far more than they currently do. New Zealand tourism, uh, or NTOs, the national tourism organization, regional tourism organizations, need to get far more savvy to bring home the message that the unit of analysis for the creation of experiences is the destination, not the individual firm. They therefore need to collaborate far more and work on how this experience they are creating can be intensified by echoing through the services they are providing. Thank you very much. Good evening, um, everyone. Um, and what a treat it is to see so many people here, friends, family, colleagues and uh, members of the community, so thank you for coming along. My name's Ken Deans, I'm the head of the Department of Marketing, so I guess that makes me Jürgen's boss. Uh, reality is I'm probably just his research and teaching coordinator and approval of his clearly not insubstantial travel plans. <laughs> However, it's an absolute pleasure to be standing close to him, <laughs> I was going to say next to him, close to him tonight, um, celebrating his achievements, celebrating his appointment to a professor, I should also tell you that Jürgen is um, the first PhD to ever have graduated from the Department of Marketing in 1994, am I right? Since then there have been a long line of about 60, you know, in excess of 60, but Jürgen was our first. Anyway, as you heard from um, George Benwell, the Dean, Jürgen is indeed a well-respected academic and moves in some impressive circles. However, it's quite clear to me, um, listening to him tonight, and I'm sure it was clear to you, um, that what Jürgen does is clearly of interest to himself but has broader application. I think it's important to the New Zealand economy. I think it's important to New Zealand's destinations. I think it's important to the thousands of people that are employed in that sector. So it's really nice to see that application um, of, of theory. He started off by questioning um, our understanding, I guess, of New Zealand's core strengths, talking about <laughs> outdoors and freedom versus shopping and gambling. Uh, at which other uh, destinations are clearly better recognized and better organized. But I think what came out of it was um, three key words for me, strategy, value, and experience. Now, he moved um, to talk considerably, at considerable length about these, particularly focusing on experience. So that this notion and the role of experience, um, I think he put it towards us that about anticipating and then reflecting positively and dopamine. I imagine you had a healthy dose of dopamine anticipating tonight, and indeed we'll have a, an equally healthy dose as you reflect on tonight's talk. So I think the issue, Jürgen, as I see it, was how we learn to experience, um, and took us through what led to his TEM, the Tourism Experience Model. Bottom line for us as marketers and um, for people in the audience is um, tourism um, academics and indeed economists, it comes down to better targeting and, and um, satisfying the tourists and relating much more to their experience and the activity that we provide for them. I think you've summed that up, I think you've brought that nicely together, the practical experience and, and, and the, the academic perspectives um, brought to bear upon it, so brilliant, thank you Jürgen. Now as I alluded at the start, um, Jürgen's got the enviable ability, I think, to go deep into the literature and philosophy of his topic and then rein it right back to the harsh practicalities. It's like um, spanning, if you like, the, the, ivory base, uh, the ivory tower where the philosophies are built and made, sixth floor in Jürgen's case, down to the ivory basement where the harsh practicalities kick in. And Jürgen spanned that. So he's done a lovely job, I think, of inviting us into his uh, world of thoughts, theories, and research agendas. So, on behalf of everybody here, Jürgen, I'd like to thank you very much for our great talk, um, some beautiful insights, and I think there's something 
to take away here for everybody. Before the rapturous applause begins, um, I should also say I have a small gift, which is neither uh, a guidebook, a bus timetable, or a bucket list. Um, but I have a small uh, token here, just so that you remember tonight, as if you could forget it. Um, but a mark of our appreciation. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you very much.